Aloha and good morning, everybody. This is our 1015 session on mission partner environment. My name is Jeff Bloom, past president of FCA Hawaii. I guess way past president now, old guy. I uh, just wanted to kick this off. Thank you for everybody coming. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Chief Stanley, John Stanley from Indopaycom J6. He will be moderating this session today. At the end, there'll be we'll throw up some slides, and you can have questions. It'll go to the back, and we can ask those questions. So, be prepared. There'll be a, a email where you can text a, or email your questions to. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. MPE is always one of those discussions that everybody wants to talk about and have questions. So, at this point, turn it over to Chief Stanley. All right. Okay. Yeah. Pin. Can you hear me? All right. So I'm CW5 John Stanley. I am the Indo-PACOM Chief Technology Officer for the J6. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to this panel to talk about how we can, you know, we can get after securing MPE. Mission partner environment is something that everybody is uh, aware of. Everybody knows we need this, is, especially in this theater, with our 30-plus partners and partners from Europe and and everybody coming in to, to support the mission in this uh, AOR. Um, I have a, a great group of people on the panel with me, um, several from industry and uh, other organizations, and um, I'm going to pass it over to them to let them talk of, uh, about a few things before we get to some of our questions, because you came here to see them what they have to say and not hear me talk. So uh, here you go. Oh, okay, perfect. This is already on. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tish Weisnick. Uh, I work at the National Cross Domain Strategy and Management Office, or the NCDSMO at NSA. Um, a little bit about me and my background. So, I've been at the agency for about four years. Um, I graduated from Temple University, Go Owls, <laughs> in Philadelphia, um, with an engineering degree, but I've worked as a systems engineer for the past six years on a variety of different things, um, including the Aegis Weapon System as my first job. Uh, and then went to NSA. Um, so I mentioned that I worked at the National Cross Domain Strategy and Management Office, or the NCDSMO. For those of you in the room that don't know who we are, um, we are the Office of Primary Responsibility for Cross Domain Technologies for the U.S. government. Um, so some of the primary services that we offer for the community and for the U.S. government include serving as the principal advisor to national security system owners for CDS capabilities, we also develop and maintain community outreach forums and programs. So for anybody who went to the Cross Domain Technical Forum, that's our major conference that we put on every year about CDS. Um, we also develop and establish improved security solutions. So our biggest one is Raise the Bar, or RTB. Um, it's a very large document that our CDS community has to build their CDSs in order to um, secure um, networks at the boundary line. Um, and then we also operate the CDS testing program or the lab-based security assessment program, LBSA, which uh, again tests these cross-domain solutions against RTB to ensure that they are secure. Um, so to take a step back, I just told you a lot about NCDSMO. For those of you in the room that don't even know what a CDS is, which is okay, a lot of people don't. <laughs> Um, it is a type of controlled interface that sits at the network boundary. Um, it's used for secure data transfer of information between networks of different classification levels. There's three main types. So there's the access solution, which allows you to view um, from multiple security domains at the, from a single terminal. Um, there's also the transfer CDS. Um, it allows secure transfer of information from less secure domains and sanitization of data originating from more secure domains. And then there's also a multi-level CDS or an MLS CDS. Um, it centrally stores information from different domains and authorizes access to information based off of the uh, user's clearance levels in originating domains. Um, so the mission partner environment is obviously an information domain. Um, for those of you guys that don't know what that is, um, it's essentially an environment where like partners and missions can collaborate on a specific topic based off of their need to know. Um, some examples of this at uh, a um, general level. Um, GM, Ford, and Stellantis, which is Dodge, Chrysler, Jeep, etc. Um, they might want to collaborate on the UAW strike and terms and conditions for um, terms and conditions for ending that strike, but they would not want to share proprietary information on their makes and models of their vehicles. 
Um, another would be Coke and Pepsi. Maybe um, they want to collaborate on new FDA regulations, but they would not want to share new formulas based off of the new regulations that came out. Um, what gives my organization the authority to operate um, as the OPR for CDS is because we sit at NSA under Dernza, our director of NSA. Um, the policies that enable us to be able to do that mission are NSD 42, um, which establishes Dernza as the national manager for national security systems, as well as NSM 8, which was just published back in January of 2022. Um, NSM-8 um, expands Stearns' national manager authorities and allows him to issue um, emergency directives, binding operational directives, and national manager memos to the NSS community to be able to better secure their systems. Um, one uh, particular BOD, or binding operational directive, that I think has a lot of uh, interest in this room is the uh, BOD, I believe the current draft number is BOD 2023-006. Um, they might switch it to 005. <laughs> um, so I, obviously I know that that's um, a big um, contentious sort of directive that we have worked really closely with our partners and back and forth for quite a while <laughs> um, to come to an agreement. I think some of you in the room might have been at the information domain tabletop exercise back in August. Um, so again, it was a community meeting hosted between NSA and the J6 and had everybody involved to come and have very passionate debates on the topic of information domain and what exactly is it and how do we address the BOD. Um, so, and obviously I think one of the biggest uh, drivers for the BOD and for also just uh, the heated debates in general is the distinction between a CDS and zero trust technologies, right? So CDS, um, just a really, simplify this, CDS is a small piece of the greater zero trust framework, right? So zero trust um, is a framework which addresses security mechanisms that should be utilized through the OSI stack within a systems architecture. So it starts at the device level and goes up. Um, a CDS is a specific piece of technology that secures network boundaries and allows the secure transfer of information. So very, very simplified terms, but again, um, we just want to make sure that everybody is doing things in a safe and secure manner and that we collaborate with our partners to be able to enable the MPE environment. Um, that wraps up my session, so I'll turn it over to Patrick. Yeah. Good morning. I'm assuming everybody could hear me. I'm pretty loud without the microphone. Uh, so my name is Patrick Perry. I'm one of the industry reps, so I work for a company called Zscaler. Um, just a, a very simple approach to it is just we deliver security through a different approach. That's really kind of the end of it. If you want to learn more, I would just, you know, invite you to come join us over at our booth and we can talk more about the capability. That's not really my goal here. My background, though, before I joined Zscale about four years ago, I spent 22 years in the Army where I retired as a warrant officer in the Signal Corps, so I know the, um, the IT environment decently well and played all sorts of different roles from very tactical, very small teams all the way up to strategic elements uh, to include COCOMs out at AFRICOM. Um, so my goal here, though, is to really kind of focus on the topic of MPE, which, again, I'm very passionate about this, about this subject, mainly just because, you know, there's no war that we'll fight in the future that doesn't involve our partners and, and everybody. I really don't understand why we ever talk about any kind of information sharing environment that's a silo of just ourselves, whether it's just ourselves in the context of the Army and not the Navy and the Air Force, et cetera, or just ourselves and not our coalition partners, you know, across this theater or any other theater. The bottom line is, is there's really no you know, conflict environment that will ever be just us by ourselves anymore. So every environment, in my opinion, is an MPE. We don't want to call it that because we have this like, concept around our head that we only care about an information environment based on administrative boundaries, not the information flow boundaries. And therefore, we kind of think that, well, hey, if it's inside the Doden A, it's not an MPE. I would challenge that because it's still part of the MPE, the environment information has to go across all of it and always will. Now, what really that boils back down to is then where are the boundaries? And the boundaries of the data, what we're really trying to share. We're not, we don't really need to give our partners access to our network. We need to give partners access to at data and information so they can be part of that, that conversation and part of that you know, uh, OODA loop on, hey, what are we gathering? What are we learning? Where are we going to go next you know, as an operational force? So I think it's really important that, you know, again, as we talk about concepts like zero trust or any other kind of technology concept, we focus on the operation requirement 
which in the end, MPE, like the rest of the information sharing operation requirements, is about getting data to the right place at the right time in a secure manner. And part of security is not just access control. I have this you know, frustration where people talk about the concept of like zero trust, where they get fully focused on just a fact of controlling access. And there's so much more, because access to bad data or manipulated data is actually worse than access, no access to good data. You know, so I think it's imperative that when we think about concepts like zero trust, and especially in information sharing environments, we don't only focus on the concepts of access control, but we think about, okay, but how are we ensuring data is as secure as it's supposed to be? You know, anybody that's been in this you know, security paradigm for any amount of time knows that the CIA triad has been the focus forever. It's still tried and true. In the end, all you have to do is just bring the, the, what your operation requirement back down to that basics of the CIA triad, and you know that, you know, again, things like confidentiality and integrity are just as important to availability. So that's all I got to kick it off, because I look forward to the questions to guide the rest of the conversations, and I'll hand it off to Major Wilson. Good morning, um, Major Jenna Wilkman. I'm from Disa Pacific. I'm the Defensive Cyber Operations Branch Chief, um, DCOIDM. Um, so, just a little bit about myself. Uh, this is my second tour with DISA Pacific. Uh, I was originally uh, here from 14 to 17 uh, in, in, within the DCO branch, um, but now I'm back as the branch chief. Um, so, I have a background in signal. Uh, I also have a background in information assurance. Um, I've also, previous to this tour, I was uh, serving in the NATO Communications and Information Agency uh, out of the Netherlands, and so I kind of associate that when I meet uh, U.S. military individuals overseas, that it's the DISA of NATO. So kind of executed the same role um, there as I do here. So um, just a little bit about uh, DCO IDM when it comes to DISA Pacific. So we have uh, two responsibilities. The first responsibility is the DISA CSSP. Uh, within the CSSP, we have the real-time analysts who are responsible for the 24 by 7 monitoring of our sensors, as well as the IAPs that we have out in the theater. Uh, we also have countermeasures who's responsible for maintaining the health of those sensors and making sure that uh, the rules are tuned and make sure they're most effective as possible. We also have cyber fusion. The team is responsible for get doing OSINT, um, as well as uh, observing what's occurring on the network. And so they kind of create a picture for our commander to give them a threat assessment based on what we're seeing um, on the network, as well as OSINT. And then we also have the discovery and counter infiltration uh, team who's responsible for hunt operations. That's a new uh, contract requirement that was just put in. So that was put in uh, about two years ago. And so they've executed several uh, hunts as well as some enterprise hunts as well. So we also do threat detection and mitigation. So the second responsibility for the DCO IDM branch is the military component. So we have several military individuals who are responsible for taking those four teams that we have, which is a contract base. So the CSSP is contractors. So we have the military that take those four elements and kind of tie them up into one to make sure that when uh, we're briefing um, peers within the theater or uh, the J6 that they get a full uh, understanding of what's happening for just the CSSP. Uh, within the Pacific. Um, they're also looking, kind of like our cyber fusion, they're also looking at OSINT reporting as well as what's occurring on the network, as well as current events that are happening in the theater and kind of trying to do a correlation of everything and kind of trying to develop a picture that way as well. Um, they also execute local hunts on our customers' networks. Um, so that's been really effective. and. Uh, We'll be releasing uh, soon a report uh, on their most recent hunt um, to the local community. Um, and again, I said OSINT several times because DISA is not an intelligence organization. They did just uh, incorporate uh, a J2 component, but that's still being developed. So we locally do not have um, intelligence uh, individuals with embedded with us. However, we're hoping that the NSA pilot that's going to be occurring in January is going to help kind of fuse that uh, gap that we have right now with the intelligence community as, as well as our individuals doing OSINT when that's not really um, their, their background. So that's the two components within uh, DCO IDM at DISA Pacific. 
Um, just wanted to give a little bit more information about the DISA CSSP as a whole. Um, so we're one of 24 certified D, uh, DOD CSSPs, and we're one of four uh, CSSPs that are for hire. So um, you have DISA, excuse me, you have DISA, you have um, NIAWIC, C5ISR, and then another organization that uh, is able to take on customers, but I believe they don't have any customers as of yet. Um, and we're all held to the same um, um, manuals and instructions, so 6510, um, 8530. We're all executing in the same manner. For DISA Pacific, uh, the CSSP, we have uh, 22, roughly 22 customers across the AOR. We have over 50 sensors on all the different land masses. Um, and then we also release weekly reporting. Um, and re uh, weekly reporting based on uh, newly reported malware as well as mitigation efforts that we implement on the network as a result of that newly reported malware. Um, so that's pretty much all I have about myself. <laughs> so, Charles. Hi. Okay, yep, it's working. And like Patrick, I'm loud, so I, the microphone's yeah. optional. Uh, Chuck White, says Charles there, but yeah. people call me Chuck. Uh, CTO, Fornetics. Uh, former Army officer, uh, counterintelligence, human variety, and have been working around things like compartmented computing, identity, and cryptography for the past 20 years. Uh, coming off of seeing the value of this, and I'm, what I'm interested in these mission partner environments, or how do we ensure that the enterprise mission partner environments, the ones that would belong to, say, Indopaycom, can interact with these episodic mission partner environments, such as the work that we've been doing with First Corps, uh, and the fact that as it goes and becomes more not just a First Corps solution, but actually a joint solution in these episodic environments. We've been an opportunity at Fornetics, we both do do products and solutions. Product sides, of course, things like cryptography and attribute-based access control. Uh, those fit into things like zero trust architecture. We're a part of the GDIT Everest zero trust, you know, mission zero trust accelerator. And that's worth noting that on that note, why that's important, you know, if Mr. Resnick was here, he'd be happy to hear this. Zero trust is a team sport. Zero mission partner environments are obviously can be vastly enabled, and we've seen that in action in mission partner environments. But no single vendor has a complete solution for this. So it's worth considering, just like no service, no organization has a complete solution either, we have to consider how the people process technology from hardware all the way through our service, cloud-based service providers, how it all comes together to facilitate what's, what stays, what's persistent, and what's episodic. I was talking to the uh, Major, Major Wilson here just right before the mics went on. Uh, you know, once upon a time in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, it's great when someone says that, we could throw things together because, hey, there is Mr. Resnick. Hey, it's see right there. Uh, it was easy to throw things together uh, in light of, eh, it's just got to work. But with the, our competition in this AOR in particular, the additional controls and the additional things about making these modular open system architectures that do this stuff becomes critical because the adversary will absolutely take advantage of that. And integrity becomes critical because there is likely to, to make it sensors have bad data versus just you know doing the simple thing and taking the entire, you know, entire node or capability out. So I'm excited to hear about this subject and I could sit here and wax on poetically for a long time but I'm going to hand it off to Darren to talk. Really, when we talk hardware, talk, let's talk. I, I'm not going to talk hardware at all. I don't know where you're coming from. Oh, my Chuck. goodness. No. So I'm uh, Darren Pulsifer. I'm the chief solution architect for uh, public sector at Intel. That's why you think I'm going to talk hardware. I just sell polished sand. That's all I really sell. Um, so people always ask, well, what's Intel have to do with you know, things like this? We do sell the chips that power the world and defend the world. Um, but we also have a lot of say around these system of systems. 
how can you leverage the latest technologies that we are deploying and developing? A lot of people don't understand um, some of the aspects of uh, silicon manufacturing. Our engineers today are um, developing technology that you're going to see five to seven years down the road. And it takes that long because we have to build new fabs. A fab is our fabrication uh, facilities. Uh, we're building two right now in um, Columbus, Ohio, um, $20 billion investment for these two fabs. And there they will produce chips at 18 angstroms. Now, 18 angstroms is really small. It's 1.8 nanometers. The coronavirus is 72 nanometers in diameter. So that'll give you a, a little taste of how small things are going. That technology unleashes whole new realms of ways of thinking about computing, thinking about protecting data, thinking about um, defending our country. Um, so I have a team of uh, solution architects like myself where we're not fiddling around with the bits and the silicon. We're trying to find out all the different ways we can leverage these new technologies and we take a systems down approach. Um, and um, what's really cool about that is a lot of the things that we can do in other industries we have found very useful in Department of Defense. For example, I, I helped um, with uh, a car manufacturer, Toyota. They wanted to uh, connect all the cars in the world so that they could monitor um, maintenance on their cars. Um, how many cars do you think uh, Toyota has in the world? 150 million. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Admiral, Admiral Flynn over there knows this because I've talked to him about this before. 150 million endpoints, and they wanted to ingest all this data and protect the data and all this. Very interesting architectures that we helped develop there. We're leveraging the same sorts of architectures in the Department of Defense. We don't have 150 million endpoints, but we have a different environment. It has to be much more secure. We have to collaborate. So there's some really cool new technologies that are, um, that are enabled from lower level uh, silicon features that I'm excited to talk today about um, because it's gonna turn our heads sideways a little bit. We're gonna start thinking about computing a different way than we've ever thought of before and this last year, frankly, um, has been uh, a huge paradigm shift that I think is gonna continue uh, to um, evolve and we're gonna have to move faster. And that's the whole Gen AI thing. Uh, that just showed us how vulnerable we really are to, to change. And we're gonna see some other changes at that kind of level um, over the next uh, four or five years. All right, thank you very much. So uh, I got a few uh, pre-planned questions that I'm going to pass along to the, the panel. And so, so first one, as the DoD moves towards data centricity and zero trust, how do we leverage that to improve collaboration and security in a mission partner environment? Are we going to? Yep, right down the line, sorry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell we coordinated really well before this? Um, <laughs> so uh, the biggest... Uh, piece of collaboration, I think, coming from my organization's perspective, right, is the fact that we are trying to issue a community vetted binding operational directive um, in order to address the establishment and operation of information domains. Um, I'm, I'm emphasizing community vetted because the spot has probably gone through so many rounds of review that I have, I think, Rev 65 currently printed out in my pad folio, and I know that it has had significant changes based off of the last round of review um, that just happened, I think, about a week ago down at the Pentagon. So it's constantly evolving because we are trying to make sure we get this right um, the first time, and so making sure that we work with everybody within the community to make sure that the bot is going to not hinder mission while still enabling cybersecurity. Um, there also, we also had, um, as I mentioned earlier, the joint um, J6 NSA tabletop exercise to talk about information domain. Um, so again, trying to come up with some um, key um, 
baseline sort of definitions that we could all agree on, um, areas where we believe a CDS might be able to be used versus zero trust and what those scenarios would be, and then some parking lot discussions on where we would address later. Um, one of them was cloud, right? Um, so there actually is going to be a cloud MPE summit that starts tomorrow. Um, through Thursday. So we'll have, again, a community event where everybody will come together to kind of talk about some of these really large but very important issues. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Patrick. Yeah, so uh, I think that the, the question is a very simple one. I mean, like I kind of alluded to at the beginning, in the end, you know, when we take these concepts like data centricity and zero trust, we're really just getting after what we've always been talking about in the military, which is, again, get information to where it needs to be to make operational decisions in a, in a secure way. You know, we've been doing this at the beginning of time. Before there was IT equipment, before there was anything, we always were a data-centric force. We just didn't have the, you know, massive amounts of data and the ability to move it around the world so fast. So when we think of these concepts, all we're trying to do is now is, again, modernize our technology in the way we do business to be more working together instead of working against each other. When you think of the fundamentals of, you know, IT information sharing and security, it's like a gas pedal and a brake pedal. You know, one is intended to be moved, the other one is intended to stop. Unfortunately, we've had the approach of saying, well, I'm going to do it, I'm going I'm I'm to use my gas and brake pedal together, hop by hop across my information environment, which unfortunately has just created more friction than anything. And with more friction and more complexity, you end up getting more gaps. And you know, the bad guys don't work in the obvious areas, they work in the gaps in the seams. You know, so it's imperative that again, the, the focus really is not about like, I, I hate to say it, just like coming up with a new concept here. We're, we're, we're using the same concepts. Where are we gonna, why are we, we have to step back, back to the operation requirements and the constraints and restraints that we're bound by and adapt to that. So zero trust is not actually really that mind-blowing. Like, it's not this new grand concept. What the whole goal here is, though, is zero trust is a mindset shift, mindset shift, there's way too many S's, where you're aligning operations back to being, you know, again, optimized with security embedded, not security as the afterthought bolt on. When you look at programmatically, we often kind of like, we build a capability based on an operational requirement. I need to move data from A to B over this kind of kit because I'm in this kind of environment, go. Okay, cool, what do I do? I start building that kit and then I bolt a little bit of security on so you know somebody gives me the thumbs up so I can connect to the bigger environment, but I only cared about my administrative boundary of what I was set forth to do. Not, well, hey, my, my commander, my users are not gonna stop at the edge of that boundary. Their information flow that operational terrain traverses the whole rest of the world most often, whether it's having to go all the way back out to the internet, to the really scary areas, or just to my partner environments, or again, the bigger, greater force. So zero trust and data centricity is about how do we remove the friction, which unfortunately means remove complexity in the environment, and optimize it based on what the rest of the world is already doing, use the, the greater technologies out there and that kind of stuff, to get after being more data centric and again, more data sharing in a secure manner at a very, you know, and again, a technological optimized thing. Now that obviously doesn't fix our processes and policies. Everybody in here will tell you our bigger problems, our processes, policies, and culture. So yeah, you always have the people and the process part of it that we have to work together as well on in improving. But the biggest thing is we've always had the opportunity to do that. My wife likes to say all the time is we can improve our processes and most often our people at no cost to us. It does, there's nothing you have to buy. You just have to drive it. You know, while technology, you have to buy it. So there, that's a big difference between the other ones. So I think there's, again, there's a real good opportunity to take the concept of zero trust and bring it back down to the, the boiling level of where are we really trying to do operationally and get these things aligned back together. Off to you. Yeah, so I say, uh, I would say personally, I would align to that, but, um working within DISA, we are uh, reliant on DOD CIO to set the framework for all the DOD CSSPs. Um, so right now that has not occurred. So until that does occur, 
Um, we're kind of uh, all creating our own solutions for securing MPE. Um, even within DISA, we have multiple efforts going on right now that aren't necessarily uh, executing in the same manner. So um, even though I agree, <laughs> I can't uh, speak on DISA's behalf or DOD CIO. So we do have a DOD CIO CSSP working group coming up in December, and that's going to be uh, one of the major topics that get proposed is that we find a baseline and, and set that up for, for the community. Because um, until we have that for the community, we're all going to be doing something slightly different, and then we don't necessarily know when the framework is to pr produced, developed, if it's going to be aligned to what we've already released out to the theater. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my take on it from a CSSP aspect. So, a uh, long time ago, Galaxy Far, Far Away, love using that phrase, but it said once you can authenticate globally, but you authorize locally. Similarly, when you're dealing with what would be traditionally network-centric implementations, and I'm going to talk about this more from the episodic point of view, how do you create data-centric enclaves? Now, marketing term, you could say elsewise, how do you establish protect surfaces? Why is MPE important? Why has these things become important? Because you start thinking about these things. What capabilities, where, what is my protect surface? What am I actually trying to build controls around? What's the value of that? Well, the first one is you get to collapse networks. Now you have to collapse networks in a way that makes every, you know, it is good from a policy perspective, but the benefit of once that network is collapsed, you can suddenly be able to bring on partners faster with particular w rules around where that data-centric security actually happens. Uh, seeing that in action, seeing the benefit of that, it definitely makes it, it does reduce complex, it does reduce complexity like Patrick said. And as long, but where the thought shift happens, and I think one thing to consider about this, we, things like zero trust architecture have been around conceptually, maybe with different terms. If you're familiar with the, you know, the intelligence community or special access program community, we've had compartmented computing for a very long time. The difference is, is that things like interoperability allows us to look at this, the fact that you know, we're coming to the realization that no one can do any of this MPE building on their own. Another realization, that's the people part. But I think at the end of the day, it's the realization that when you go data centric, the concept of a network and having to establish separations by multiple networks becomes a little not as necessary as it used to be. And so that's a bit of that thought shift, and I think the real benefit is less networks. Less networks means less complexity. Ability to uh, emphasize controls in the key, pl in key places so that you can, you, you're, you're not you're not, the seams or that defense and transition becomes so much easier because you're presenting less seams to be exploited. You know, at, at first, um, at first thought, when you think about these two concepts, zero trust and MPE, they're diametrically opposed to each other. Because I don't want to share, but I have to share. I want to protect my data. I don't want anyone in my, in my stuff, right? And when you first think of zero trust, when people first think it, the, some of the tenants are trust no one, verify continuously. So they seem somewhat opposed. But I like what you said, Chuck, where you said, hey, if we move to more data-centric, that changes things. So this is where we have to tilt our head sideways a little bit, yeah, just a little bit. And then we have to also look at what new capabilities can technology bring that can change our people and our, our process problem. Because I totally agree, people, process, culture, policy, those are the hard things that are harder to change. And even though they don't cost money up front, the cost is huge to make those changes. Because uh, people like doing what they know. They like what they're used to. So if we turn things on the side a little bit, there's new technologies out there that can enable us to actually share results without sharing the data. And it's a weird concept. Um, these are concepts like collaborative confidential computing, where you can create a secure enclave of data and algorithms that trans 
form data, and let's say both of them are top secret data and top secret algorithms that do some kind of manipulation on the data to give me end results, but then the end results are spit out to the partners. So I'm not really sharing the data, I'm not sharing the algorithm, but the end results are shared. These new types of concepts are really turning the whole zero trust and MPE conflict that we normally have kind of on its side because it's a new modality of operating that we haven't thought of before. So this is where we start needing to challenge the ways that we've done things in the past. There's got to be better ways to do it because in MPEs, the result is the most important part, not even the data or the algorithms. It's the result, the information that I'm producing out of it. So, Chuck, I know you want to say something. Uh, I want to say something. I only th that in a you know war on terror universe, hundred percent agree. We now do integrity of data, the means of how data is transported, how we put yeah. we we are dealing in a conflict or as a competition conflict crisis environment where our threats have changed. And they play by the same playbook that we do. And so are you saying they could spoof data? Is that where you're coming from? That's this? exactly. Or maybe. Or even spoof algorithms. Or spoof hardware. Or spoof hardware. Yeah. I mean, that, well, that's, that's never happened. Yeah, never. Never, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I see your point, and that's, that's why it's so important to have and, and leverage some of the, the existing technologies to help prevent those sorts of things from happening as well. And, and agreed. And just noting, it, it's that sort of that it's counterintuitive, but in a sense, zero trust enables MPEs because you're addressing 100% agree. all the headaches and complexities where we would say let's throw another network at it, which is you know, from a from a signal you know, from a signal operator's perspective, that's more complexity and more risk. So I think at first it might I, for me, you know, when I could collapse networks, you know. That's something that gets you to a lot more, you know, gets you to lethality a lot quicker. To totally agree. Sorry, we went on a side. Sorry, no, no, it's, it's fine. I, that's, that's actually what I want. I want you to get you know, the conversation. <laughs> Does anybody else want to add to the, the yeah, thing at all? Yeah, I guess I'll offer is I, I, I truly believe that, again, the foundations of zero trust is actually 100% in line with MPE. Right. The, again, the foundation of zero trust was, you know, going all the way back to the deprimatization effort. And, you know, just like, again, Agile was founded with their own little manifesto, so was Zero Trust. It wasn't called Zero Trust back then, but the whole principles was is people and data are not always in the same building together anymore. Yep. And they're not even always on the same team, but we, may, we have to account for that you may need to get, get access to data that you don't administratively control from a location that you don't administratively control and vice versa. The whole concept was founded in that, which again is exactly what MPE's concept is. I've got data, they've got data, we need to share, but we don't control all the environment you know, uh, equally. You have your rules, I have my rules, I put my boundaries, you put your boundaries. But again, that we're, we're talking about boundaries upon infrastructure, not boundaries upon data. And I, again, zero trust, the concept really behind zero trust is securely moving data from any kind of user to any kind, through any kind of environment in abstracting the security from the infrastructure, like we used to always do it, we still kind of do, unfortunately, to back to how do I secure a flow, make sure it maintains that CIA you know, pro uh, um, approach, and the bad guy can't influence or take it, period. Which again, that's all MPE, so I don't really think they conflict with each other at all if we boil it back down to the, 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 the real foundation of zero trust, not some of these new interpretations of what zero trust is now. That, that's where I totally agree with you, Patrick. Yep. Yeah, you got to get down to the core, the core beliefs, the core principles behind it. With the idea that things like the MITRE attack framework didn't exist back in, you know, uh, 15 years ago when we were doing things like this, they do such a far better job of doing the inverse to defend the network, you know, to actually build those controls. We, it's, we could define the problem but we maybe not didn't know what we were solving, but now I think there's a better case. We actually know what type of problems we're solving, which, you know, if you know your enemy, it's better, you can, you can better engage it. Yeah. All right, great conversation. So keep, it, keep the conversation going. Um, second question here is, with the uh, incorporation of new technologies, new I modalities and how we're moving forward, and we push data and services to the edge to collaborate with our partners, 
How do we conduct security monitoring and management in this new environment? How do we monitor and manage data centricity? Okay. All right, so again, I'll go ahead and start. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but the BOD does have, um, addresses defensive monitoring requirements for information domains. Um, so it references a couple of documents that my organization actually produces um, that kind of goes into the nitty gritty of setting up an out of band environment to be able to do DCO, which I think um, Major um, Welchin, am I pronouncing your name? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm Weissnick, so I guess it's no better. <laughs> But um, so, which I think that she can speak a little bit more eloquently on than me, but we do, uh, we are addressing that area at least um, from the policy perspective. Yeah, so I mean, thankfully again, the new concepts that are driving everything like zero trust are founded in that feedback loop of data analysis and getting you know everything to your uh, SOC per se and that kind of stuff and adjusting. I think the real problems are gonna be back down to your, you know, to the question of, but how are we gonna be able to fundamentally continuously do that at the lowest levels. You know, when you think about, you know, concepts like a SOC or, you know, data analytics or security analytics and that kind of stuff to feed back that loop, whether it's a CSSP or whatever, we have a tendency in IT to always want to center, uh, centralize and enterprise these kind of things because we have efficiencies to be gained. You know, the collection of more data from different sources will give you a better view of what you should really be worried about, but that doesn't always help the people right there on the ground at that edge. How are we going to do it there? And I think that's still the hard problem that we have to figure out, mainly because data analytics and all that kind of stuff take a lot of resources. And the biggest thing that you don't have at the edge is resources. Whether it's, you know, we always like to joke around ping power pipe. You know, do I have those things? Do I have enough infrastructure to have all the data, the analytics there? Do I have enough power to run it? If you've ever had to hump your own power, you know that's like the worst thing in the world to have to account for. And then down to, can I get the data out to the decision maker and back down to the, the people need to move back to that whole from the, the, the shooter to the sensor, shooter to the Pentagon, whatever is the new you know, buzzword on that whole concept. But I think that's gonna be the biggest thing. I think it's there, I think that's possible. But then, it, so it's not about that we can't do it or we don't have some options is don't chase perfection. There is no perfect answer for this. Figure out the 60, 70, pick your number that you want to gauge upon. Get something so you can start learning and adapting to that. What is the amount of information that the CSSP needs at that level to make, again, an informed decision, you know, at that level? You don't have to solve the entire Doden, you know, CSSP problem at the smallest edge level. Yeah, so um, kind of going off that topic, um, we are working right now with Indopaycom for their IMN uh, CSSP effort. And so with that, we are looking at uh, ingest, t doing different uh, resources and ingesting the data and, uh, to a centralized location. But we do understand that we're not, we shouldn't be thinking of doing CSSP at the perimeter as the traditional, um, but we should be doing CSSP for a data-centric environment. Um, so we're, our team locally is actually working with the Indopaycom team as well as some of our individuals at headquarters to try and build out what that would look like. Um, and we're trying to do that with the IMN network right now. So um, we're not there yet. <laughs> like we're not, there were, like the community is not there yet. Um, but like you said, we're trying to do like the 30, 60, 90, um, trying to figure out if it's if what we're gonna do uh, to support IMN is gonna work. And if it does work, then keep building it out and try to share that with our peers within the community to show what an effort, that the effort, if the effort worked and was successful, a use case for them to then modify and adapt off of. Since we don't have a DOD CIO policy on how to execute or framework on how to execute. So we're kind of doing that now um, with IMN. So that's, our, that's where we're trying to go. But we are going to be um, using a centralized location. We have SIMs and uh, SARS and uh, SIM, but um, we're not at the uh, data-centric environment point yet, but that is the end state, the ideal end state. Yeah. See the smile on my face. So <laughs> having seen this done, and I'm looking at you, Chief Diepa, <laughs> uh, in terms of, I think what's important and I'm looking at Mr. Resnick now too, use cases as you get to smaller and smaller footprints around particularly, uh, you know, sort of the 
automation, orchestration, and visibility, and analytics. Because actually seeing in action that you can take data in these episodic environments and it can be used to inform your mission partner environment, it is, it's absolutely doable. Uh, and it has value and it has benefit. Now, I think the question we can ask ourselves is what is the best way we can do it so that that, that, that sensor becomes something that can have value outside of what that tactical MPE might look like so it can actually feed higher into the organization. And creating alignment between like IMN and any episodic network that would be stood up to support a mission partner environment so there's consistency in how that data or there's understood value by both sides what that audit data would actually be. So you can you know, use it locally or it can be used to make decisions on a broader scale. Well, I, I like what you said there that we, because there is more capability on the edge to run analytics on the edge, even little bits of analytics, I don't have to send as much data back, hopefully, right? Uh, but you always have the power of problem. But what you're going to find is um, we're going to be able to, to do more of that work on the edge so I can run a team that's in a DDL environment. Without, and I can still run security, make, making sure that they haven't been hacked, even in a small group, without having to send log files up to be analyzed in a data center. We're going to start seeing new technologies develop that can handle that in very small form factor, very small power, so that I can run those analytics locally. That will unleash a lot of uh, more secure type of groupings that I can have in these MPE environments that I wasn't able to have before. So I think the technology is going to help out quite a bit with, with this aspect. Another point that's important, though, with the security as well is we need to secure our supply chain on this as well. Because you mentioned earlier we've got issues where hardware has been spoofed, right? Um, there's lots of cases out there. We, we've got to do a better job on securing our supply chain, knowing where all of the components on our motherboards came from, knowing if our adversary has backdoor access to those chips, to, to the, the motherboards themselves. These have been problems that have come up, and we don't like to talk about them because we go, no, I'm, you know, if we cover our eyes and our ears, they didn't happen. They do happen. We've got to pay attention, and we've got to do a better job as an industry on fixing that problem. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and a similar question I, you know, I'm going to ask, it's, you know, because transitioning to zero trust and data centricity, it's not going to be quick. We're going to have network-centric environments for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, it, and as we get better in, in this, it's going to go faster and faster. But until that point, how do we continue to leverage the current security technologies we have in place while adopting new technologies and methodologies? I, I want to hop on that real quick. Okay. Sorry, I'm, we'll the I'm, other, I'm we'll, jumping we'll, we'll the ship, this way, right? This time. This so, way, perfect. Um, we don't have to replace. We can write on top of. That's, that's an important aspect, especially as things become more software-defined. If I do have a software-defined network in place or software-defined compute and storage and security and accelerators and things like that, I don't have to necessarily re replace the hardware. I can actually put n these new types of architectures on top of existing and get some benefit right away without a full rip and replace, which is a change from I know what we're used to. We're used to I've got to build the application, security, and hardware stack together, validate it all together. We need to move away from that mentality of thinking. Or, frankly, I'll be brutally honest, our adversaries will move much faster than we can, and we're going to be in, in, in a world of hurt. So I'm going to quote the Australian Defense Force uh, coming out of looking at when we had an environment in Australia that had Marines, Navy, Army, and then the ADF. And the term that the Australians use is the, 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 what you can do is you establish data-centric enclaves in a network-centric environment. This works nicely in general 
Mr. Kinderbag was here from you know, talking about zero trust and the idea of protect surfaces. Those enclaves fit nicely with the idea of protect surfaces. So you would, though it would be great to take on the entirety of something, a reasonable approach is to take on capabilities, one service or application at a time, because doing it that way and expanding the enclaves of data centricity accounts for some other realities, uh, modalities in which applications or processes act. So something that might work with a, a plug-in as a policy enforcement point, that would be able to put some little zero trust stuff into a mission partner environment, that works for one application, but for another application that you're bringing into this data-centric enclave, it might need something more like network micro-segmentation because that's what it can actually support. And so addressing this as you, you kind of take on more and more, you expand the data centricity, you sort of, you know, thin edge of the wedge, land and expand, whatever you want, what cute term you want to use, is a way to get there so that you're, you know, being able to implement this in operational environments and get benefit from it immediately. Now, it'd be great if we could do it all from scratch, and in some cases, we will be able to do that. But in other cases where things are already in place, I think as identifying the on data-centric enclaves and expanding is a reasonable approach to get us from point A to point B. All right, thank you. Yeah, so I think it's kind of a difficult question um, when you look at the CSSP footprint because um, we only have several offerings that we can, we can do and none of them fit this, <laughs> this format. Um, so we don't have a zero trust offering and we don't have um, you know, MPE offering. So we're, we are building our MPE CSSP effort from scratch basically, but we are trying to utilize the resources that we have in place uh, in order to do so. Um, so we have the I, uh, MPE effort um, and we're trying to utilize that to incorporate into the IMN effort. So it's, um, we're, we're starting from scratch and we're not, <laughs> we're trying to utilize the equipment we currently have in place to support IMN, um, but that is a, a local uh, initiative and it is not uh, a headquarters or a DOD CIO initiative. So it's uh, kind of a interesting when you look at the DSSP effort because we don't offer um, zero trust. We, we are making it as we go. Um, so we don't necessarily have the benefit of um, repurposing much. Because, yeah. yeah. Patrick? Yeah, so um, I think this is, is a topic that we, we kind of uh, overthink, you know, because again, we, we kind of try to say like, oh crap, you know, you can either do brownfield or greenfield. You know, out in industry, they have a very simple approach to these kind of questions. How do we get to the future with either leveraging our current investment or start over, you know, whatever. You know, but, but this isn't a new concept, you know, and I think that, again, we, we kind of paralysis by analysis. We overthink this problem. If we just look at the fundamentals of planning, of backwards planning, we set the target in a, in a reasonable state. The, the DOD CIO office, CIO office gave us that reasonable state. 2020X, I can't remember what it is, so I won't try seven. seven, thank you. You know, again, that gives you the backwards plan. You might not be able to do a full green field over a brown field. You may not have to be able, you know, whatever. You have lots of restraints out there. We all got restraints. You know, but the bottom line is get moving towards that goal. And again, maybe there's a way that if we look at, again, MP environments, that operational requirement, getting data from point A to point B, regardless of the infrastructure, slightly different, we realize with today's technology, we can overlay security flows, AKA a greenfield approach, right over your brownfield investment. There's lots of opportunity. You can look out to industry to see those examples and ideas. You don't have to reinvent this wheel. People like to say like, ah, but hey, we're in the army, we're in the DOD, we do things different. We have different mission. You're 100% right, but that's only the why out of the equation. The what, the how, the where, the when is pretty much fundamentally the exact same with industry. And when I say industry, I don't mean the tech vendors, you know, coming to us. I mean, what are like the big conglomerate banks doing? You don't think they have this problem and they've had it forever? You don't think pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, have these problems? Yes, they do. They just have a slightly different definition of why they have to get after that problem. But the operational requirement of securely moving data 
from point A to point B when you don't administrate own all of it has always been out there. There's, it's not something new. I would implore you to learn from industry. I know it's really hard. It's very easy for me. I've been retired for four years. I get to like spend the majority of my time looking at industry, seeing all these things while you guys are head, head down after the fight, nonstop, never enough resources, but plenty of mission to get after. I get it. I implore you to take the 1% of your time to get your head up, look out there to the world and see what the world is doing. The world is solving these problems. They're solving it in a manner that's way faster. Yes, you guys have 1.4 million people in the army, but guess what? There are very, very large companies out there with 1.1, 1.5, and even in the two, three. I think Walmart is like two and a half million people globally. You're not the largest organization. The army is not. You're the most bound by policies and restrictions and how your budget comes in. 100% again, back to that whole people process, tools part. But that tool side of the house if you want to plan for your future, you can 100% leverage what you have, but it may not look like that in four years as you start phasing things out and incorporating the, future, the, the current capabilities that are out there that can actually get after the future problems at the same time. If you're familiar with uh, Professor Deming, Edward Deming, the like, godfather of quality control and the foundation of all other concepts like agile, lean, all that kind of stuff grew from Deming, he, he always said that, hey, we teach people to solve problems from yesterday. We better start teaching people to solve problems for tomorrow. So if we don't get in the mindset that yes, there's an opportunity to solve tomorrow's problems right now with technology to include this subject specifically, it's there. Where can you learn from to not have to reinvent the wheel? And that's what I would offer. You can it, you leverage your current investment, but you better plan for the future of having better stuff, newer stuff that does things in ways that can solve tomorrow's problems. All right. Thank you. Okay. I like not going first. <laughs> so um, CDSs obviously are one of the existing security technologies that we currently use, right? So that network-centric security that we uh, kind of currently operate under, and CDSs are a big part of that. Um, so I'm here um, for the NCDSMO, but I'm also an NSA rep. So from the information domain side of the house, we are working with the community to establish requirements um, for both functional and security um, on information domains. And then how um, we are, and how we, um, I'm sorry, uh, we're also working with the community just in, in writ large in order to um, develop testing standards for information domains to make sure that all of the technologies integrate together and work as the way that they're supposed to and intended. Um, and make sure that they're also agile to be able to modernize as new ZT technologies come online. Um, so for the case of CDSs, uh, once um, a ZT, ZT technologies are sort of uh, picked for the department, because I know that 2027 deadline is coming, um, it's almost 2024, but once that set of um, the tools and um, technologies are picked. Uh, we, as NCDSMO, will work with our CDS community to make sure that the CDS vendors are able to um, integrate with the ZT technologies to be able to filter and practice that data-centric security um, while still protecting the network boundaries. So um, that concludes my piece. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So uh, now I'd like to open it up to any questions that got submitted. Um, this is kind of like a first, whoever wants to answer it kind of thing. There were not, so, you know, it's kind of like a free for all right now. So. <laughs> so, yeah, so if there's any questions that get submitted, uh, go for it. We have received a lot of questions oh. from the audience. I apologize in advance if we ask something that you've already covered. Uh, just let me know and we'll move to the next one. First question, what's the future of the All Partners Access Network with so much rich, publicly available information being shared? Can we use APAN to share big data with our partners? Well, um, I think <laughs> I'll jump on that one. Um, uh, well, the APAN, you know, there's a lot of things going on with it. It's been around for a long time. Um, they are, the MPCO office is working on how to make it better, how to improve it, take it from being just a SharePoint site, pretty much, into something that, into, that can be leveraged. Because it's not just us saying, hey, APAN needs to move, APAN needs to get better, sharing data, sharing big data, and everything, but um, even the partners, all the partners on APAN are like, how do we get better, what are we going to do next? And, and so everybody's interested in this, but it's, 
the MPCO offices has to figure out how do you take this site that is shared around the world uh, pretty much to and improve it and be able to take adapt it to more than just a file repository that has some things we can get to to something that we can actually operationalize to some effect at the IL-2, maybe even eventually the IL-4 level. So it's, things are coming. Um, it's, I know it's not a great answer, it's not, uh, 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 but having just been in a meeting with uh, the maritime interoperability in France, this, was a, this thing came up. This is actually something they're talking about. You know, every time it, anybody involved in APAN comes together, it comes up. So we are talking about it. We're looking at it. Um, it's owned by the MPCO office right now, so we're kind of waiting on, have to work with them to figure out how to get those requirements to them, and they can come out and say, okay, this is what we're going to go with. So it's, it's, a, it's a collaboration. We can't do it all on our own, so, but much, much is going to happen, much is going to change. So I know it's not a, uh, the exact answer, you know, for the question, but that, that's where it's going. And so. Yeah, so I'd like to speak on that as well. So uh, DISA Pacific was previously the CSSP for APAN. Um, NIOIC uh, is right now uh, the CSSP for APAN. Um, but there's a great hesitation from the leadership to have any security mechanisms on APAN because it is supposed to be a public accessible network to all nations. So having a CSSP monitoring what's going on, monitoring uh, users and users' activity, isn't necessarily aligned to what APAN is specifically there for. Um, so there's some hesitation there on the CSSP aspect of it, of monitoring. So I know NIOIC, uh, NIOIC has that mission now, um, and we've had conversations with them about our previous experience. But um, yeah, so if the security-wise of APAN is not where the NPE network would be. No. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? I know it's very. That was a very niche question. So, yeah. so, well, so I'm just okay, going to channel my inner Patrick here. This is where we talk about confidentiality isn't only the only capability or tenant we need to address. In the case of APAN, perhaps it's more of an integrity play. You know, the quality of the data being shared versus you know who gets access to it. Time to consider. All right. All right. Next question. Thank you. Next question. Since the information management network can be extended to service networks via controlled distribution consoles from a technical standpoint, can policy be defined so that service components can leverage commercial solutions for classified solutions to access MPEES? All right. So <laughs> very niche questions we're going after right now. So um, I'll help out with a little bit of that one. Um, Right now, they're, as far as I understand, I could be, you know, correct, you know, from the NSA point of, you know, or DISA, there is no policy saying you can't. Thank you know, sure. there, if you have, if you get a CSFC solution that has been approved by the NSA, um, go forth and be fruitful and multiply. Um, it, it's, 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 you know, in my opinion, this is just Steve Stanley talking. When we're dealing with partners, and especially newer partners and partners who really don't have the the background or the finances or everything to buy type one encryption and move that way. The CFC, CSFC concept is the pretty much gets them in the door. It gets people to be able to you know go out to industry. Hey, I need a solution that does this. The NSA says yes, that meets our standards, and we can start talking. We don't have to worry about comsec. We don't have to worry about trying to buy ten thousand uh, dollars you know hardware to do a secure communications, and we can bring more partners in together. So I'm always a big a big fan of CSFC and you know anytime we talk to mission partners that's I think in my opinion where we need to start the conversation so anybody else so I can um, just say that there actually is a solution for CSFC that would be able to allow somebody to access MPEs yes I think the bigger um, hurdle we have to jump over is getting the bot out and getting it defined and getting it an ATL right an ATC right so once we get that um, taken care of there are technologies um, that are in place uh, that would be able to allow a user to access it through CSFC, but. I was gonna say along those, on the ATC side, there's numerous protection profiles mm -hmm. that could be used for suites and capabilities that to build up your MPE. So I could think of a number of them that would be apropos in terms of your foundational for data protection, you know, data transmission, 
PKI. There's a whole, these are all things that inform a mission partner environment. Uh, and if you can build it off of something that fits for commercial solutions for classified, hey, you should, to, to Chief's point, uh, be fruitful and multiply. You know, go, go, that, that it makes a ton of sense. It's, it's a juxtaposition that things like zero trust or mission partner environments and CSFC are, they're much like this conversation we were talking earlier with Darren, they're, they're, they're not, they're complementary. You can make an MPE made up of CSFC components. That is perfect. You can make zero trust architecture using CSFC components. Just happens to be that, you know, yes, one's got a well-defined, you know, implementation, that ATC associated with it. Uh, but that being said, you can build these services, which end up being from an MPE is broader than an individual capability. It just means that you have to be considerate of what that system brings when you incorporate those CSFC components into a broader MPE. Yeah, I'll, the only thing I'll add is, you know, CSFC, I've, you know, working with it for decade plus, I think it's an amazing approach to things. I think people, again, get hung, you know, hamstrung over, you know, oh, yeah, I can only use these approved kits, you know, and unfortunately, when you have an approved kit, therefore, it's end to end. The last thing that we, you know, have the flexibility to do is hand over end to end devices to partner nations sometime, because you're handing over certain technologies, you know, in the type one world, because, the majority of the components of CSFC are being done all the time. You know, whether it's, again, you have an identity, you have PKI, you have this. The big thing that people usually get wrapped up and try to, like, correlate and make it synonymous is CSFC is dual tunneling to get rid of the, the HP, which, again, you know, so get away from that SG encryptor and go towards, you know, two layers of, you know, authorized encryption. Well, we, we still have laws and restrictions on what kind of encryption and thing and even hardware modules that we can hand over to certain nations. So you still have the same problem, you just move the problem. So I think there's a lot of things. So again, it's, I don't think a policy would be the right approach because you know I think Elon Musk said, once you have a policy, now you can never do anything different. We get so stuck by only following the policy and we don't think differently, we don't act differently. We don't need a policy. We just need, again, reapproach the, the, the problem statement and what CSFC means to everybody and then just keep getting after it. I think there's lots of opportunities to do it, but I don't believe a policy is the right approach. Anybody else? Okay, next question. Next question. What are your thoughts on a data mesh, i.e. leaving data in its secure authoritative sources and accessing it based on existing access controls in real time? I love it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, this please. is the direction we should be moving in a, in a big way. And um, because the, the, the whole concept of moving everything from the edge into a data center or all the cloud service providers will say, oh, no, just move it into the cloud does not work when you're in wartime. The first thing that's going to happen is they're going to cut comms. And now your data mesh, if you do it appropriately, your data mesh can um, handle detail environments appropriately. Decisions are pushed out to the edge. Um, this, is, this is where we need to do things. Also, if you look at just the sheer volume of data being generated by sensors at the edge, you don't have pipes big enough that can, or even a place to store it all. Uh, that'll be able to do all this work. Uh, so for me, yeah, data meshes is, is the wave of the future, and we should embrace uh, the concept. Some some of the technology I'm not happy with, but the concepts are out there and, and should be embraced. To hammer on that from an identity perspective, you know, the idea of creating that identity mesh or identity fabric where you could have between your enterprise or your, and your episodic environment is really the only way you can fly so that those episodic environments can be stood up, can be used, can be disconnected and still operate. So I think understanding the architecture at a whole of what the mesh needs to look like is something we have to do, but the value I think is already starting to be established. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a no brainer, but it's the complexity in terms of how you get from point A to point B is where the, where the fun and excitement is. And the hard part, Zscaler is going to solve for us, which is the access control across the federated uh, domain, right? Patrick? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only thing I'll say about it is, again, data, data mesh is another Lego block in 
you know, the thing you're trying to build with your Legos. It has its place, it'll have a purpose, it can shape and connect where you need it to be, but it's not an answer for everything. You know, don't look at data mesh as the big, you know, golden ticket to solve your problems on secure access or author authoritative yeah. sources, especially when you think of the concept of MPE. There is no authoritative source in the, anymore, really, in MPE, because every partner is going to have their own. They're even going to define it slightly different. You have no ability to control their administrative environment. So again, you have to maintain flexibility. But I 100% I that if you're not thinking of data mesh for architectures where it's fit, then again, you're missing out on what people are using all over the world to, again, lean into the future. All right, anybody else? Okay, some great questions. I greatly appreciate it. Let's keep going. Thank you. What, what changes or challenges does MPE face as it moves to the cloud? How will you handle authentication and encryption and sharing information with other countries? All right. Who wants to go first? Oh, I could take this one. Uh, Darren, I want to say what Darren's one of my, what happens in a case of conflict, uh, the first thing when someone takes a large rock to the, your comms and makes your cloud go away. So that's where seek answer on data mesh. Uh, and we kind of hit the encryption component in light of the CSFC question, you're gonna to have to be selecting cryptography that is authorized to be used and shared. So in some cases, it's gonna be the lowest common denominator. And that's you know, just the way it is. I mean, elsewise, you could have a potential, there's, there's issues about you know, sharing, let's say, suite A uh, versus a commercial national security algorithm suite, even from that perspective. Authentication, I think we've been talking about this as well, the idea being that you're not going to control, if you're going to federate identity, like we've already seen being used, uh, you're going to, what you're going to need is specif specification on methods in which identity can be presented into a mission partner environment. And I, that, that's, that's something where, say you're working with the Australians, well, they have robust infrastructure, and it was simply a matter of federating identity in. Uh, some of our other partners, particularly in this AOR, you know, say, I'll well, go from a couple to uh, Indonesia, they might not have that infrastructure in place yet. So you're going to be dealing with a separate, you know, you're going to have a consideration of how authentication and ultimately identity is going to be, going to be addressed for those, those partners. So I think the idea being is you need the ability to federate an identity in, you need the ability to synchronize an identity, and you need to be able to have some capacity to generate identity for partners who just don't have the means themselves. You know, another thing I was just thinking of when you were talking about this is with the different levels of encryption technology available across different partners, if you, if you did a collaborative confidential computing enclave, then you don't care you can protect at different levels and decrypt at the individual levels because neither side can see the unencrypted information. So this concept of collaborative confidential enclaves means that um, I can put secure information from different parties into the same enclave, run the analytics on it, and neither side sees each other's stuff. Um, which is a very powerful move in, in something where you've got different encryption um, technologies. So that, that could be an option for, for that last one. All right. You know, I, I, got, I definitely have thoughts on this. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Go for it. Um, you know, taking the, taking the two questions and breaking them down, the first question, it says moves to the cloud. You know, again, I'd offer there's three versions of the cloud, private, public, and hybrid. Therefore, again, three different problem sets. Uh, you have three different questions ultimately there. If it's a private cloud, nothing changed. Obviously, if it's hybrid or public, you know, the, the, the foundation of MPE is moving data between the different environments. So, and the, the definition of cloud, everybody likes a little sticker, they've probably seen it. What is the cloud? Somebody else's computer. Well, guess what? We've already been doing that. That's the definition of MPE. Data is on, sitting on somebody else's computer all the time. So it's really, again, now you're, you know, you boil it down to what are the challenges to accessing our approach to cloud? That's really the problem, and I think there's a lot. Why? Because again, we haven't boiled what the cloud means to us, truly. We keep taking the commercials, you know, or the industry's version of cloud, where they have massive access, because again, one of the, one of the fundamental principles of cloud is, you know, multi-access or whatever the access, you know, part of it is, and we constantly say we're gonna uncloud the cloud. You know, we don't need multi-access, we don't want to have, to have all that flexibility back, when it's not really a cloud anymore. 
It's again, it's just a data center with a different hypervisor or something abstracting infrastructure and hardware for you to place data back on it. You know, so then when you move on to the second part of the question of authentication and encryption, nothing changes with the cloud. You know, again, because again, we've always operated with other people's computers in mind. So, you know, that's the whole foundation of MPE is it worrying about, hey, I'm moving data from my administered environment where I can, I know the TPM chips, I know we meet 857, thousand controls, I know all this stuff, but I might move my data that I'm concerned with to somebody else's environment. So I need to account for encryption to get it there, encryption while it's there, et cetera, et cetera. We've been doing that forever. You know, again, it's just, if anything, the concepts of cloud bring you more options. I mean, yes, you have to worry about the operational challenges, but I don't really think the operational challenge has changed. You know, again, now if you're using a commercial cloud, to place your data, all you do is introduce a third party that you are now worried about also getting access to that data and again, impacting that CIA triad. But it's not, but again, the whole world has been facing this forever. I wouldn't say that it's a new, a new problem. It's just, you're introducing it actually, a little bit of addition. It actually complexes the problem a little bit, right? Because each cloud service provider has their own security profiles. Yes, I would offer, security. but that's an operational decision. Could correct. So yes, if you decide to spread it across four different clouds that all do you know encryption in different ways and all that kind of stuff, you you added more complexity. You know, again, it's a balance. Oh. Data providence becomes an issue then as well. One of the other things to consider about that, because depending on you know where that other computer sits, there can be issues from a sharing perspective, and that, that's per particularly if you're using a commercial cloud and you're being driven by this. But the idea of data providence or where it's coming from or where it's going to be sitting becomes an interesting challenge which goes by a hybrid cloud or a private cloud can have some value particularly in this aor where there could be some consternation if you have a data center in one country because that's where the cloud is being service is being offered and you're trying to provide that to another country where they might have issues with that being in that first country in the first place uh, so I think that's that, but that that's that has less. That's much more of a process and people issue that you that creates complexity on the technology. Yeah, I'd offer though. Again, if we're talking about cloud, we're talking about you know government data. You know, we have these beautiful concepts like FedRAMP and DoD impact levels and that kind of stuff. And you know, we're talking about a lot of data where they have those constraints built in too. You know, so thankfully you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to leverage. The option there because in the end you know mpe back to the found the fundamental approach of you know let's just say us to one partner just a bilat you know the data had to start and or end in some kind of us soil yep therefore most people that we have a bilat or multi-lat with has already accepted their data being in us control at some point and thankfully again there are many cloud solutions that's already accounted for that for you you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to, oh, crap, I need to go build, have Google build me a data center and, you know, pick a country. You know, it's again, oh, hey, you already did it for me. Great. You know, you got that broad access thing that we really wanted, even though we're going to disconnect it all the time. You know, so I think, I think it's still there. I don't think it's a new challenge. We've already worried about it. You know, I think it's more of a, you know, hey, do you understand how government clouds have been being built anyways? They've been built to account for that stuff. Yeah, I like how you said that because you can't forget about that part. You have to still pay attention to it. And JWCC yep. should alleviate some of that as well because they only allow the four cloud providers. And in, in JWCC, again, the mechanism there is to improve the, you know, approach of, of consuming cloud services, you know, in a very, you know, you know, optimized way because we all know the four-letter word of acquisition, you know, slows loads of things down. But again, they, they have accounted for those things. Hey, have we accounted for data sovereignty laws. Focus on the U.S. first, of course. Yep. But the good thing is, is any bilat MP environment that we come into agreement with, with a partner, U.S. soil is going to be an authorized place for that. The challenge and the thing to be interested and concerned about, as remember we're talking about we want to collapse networks here, is what happens when you have, when it was, when it was one bilat or a trilat. It's what happens when you have multiple partners that traditionally would not be working mm -hmm. together, bringing them together. So that's one of the things, just, it, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's not necessarily a technical challenge. We have all the widgets ready to go. It's working them through the value of what an MPE will bring and what, whether, you know, access to data, 
you know, how your, how your data-centric enclaves are being established and how controls are growing out from there. I think it's a socialization and education thing to be able to create those, those, those capabilities. And it's more of a challenge here in Indo-PACOM than in other places, because you know, if you're in Europe, you got NATO. NATO just makes that all go away. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you know, between Chief and you know, General Miles and his team, you guys kind of are NATO. You're, supply, you're supplying all the infrastructure or you're expected to do it. So now you have challenges that NATO just kind of sweeps under the rug. Not really sweeping under the rug, but have means to account for. But we now have to account for them here. And if we're going to get to that value and efficiency of collapsed networks, we still that, that, that's why data providence becomes an issue. Maybe to, to, as much as where is the data coming from and how do you put controls around it? Oh, yeah. And then, you know, coming in cloud, and one of the things that's, if we're looking at gov clouds and everything else, um, we're still in the, the nation stages of having a, an approved SecRel cloud to even operate out of. So that's also another challenge we have to deal with when we're even talking about cloud and MPE. You know, if we're going to be at, because there's, you know, the different IO levels, like as, you know, Patrick mentioned, you know, we can do IL4, IL2, we can do stuff like that. But we're talking like actual SecRel levels. No one's been approved yet that, you know, or, or in the process of getting officially approved it can hold a SecRel cloud that we can leverage and, you know, work with our partners to do stuff in the cloud. So, but again, that comes down to policies and it's not a technology issue. It's, it's not. It is a policy and uh, policy issue <laughs> pretty much. And then working through those processes with the appropriate policy owners to, to update data sovereignty laws and everything else to be able to facilitate those kind of operations. But that's a huge advantage of going, if you think about it from an episodic perspective, you can address those as they come up and are established. And so you have a little more operational flexibility as long as there's alignment with what the big muscle movements are from like say an endopaycom perspective. Yeah. yeah, and that's a big challenge in our, like you said, a big challenge in our theater. We don't have NATO. Yeah, we have 32 countries that like to play with each other, maybe, maybe not, depending on the day, the wind blows, and we have to operate and work with all of them. So it, it's, it's a challenge that NATO makes easier, but then also NATO's coming to play in our theater, so we actually have that as well to work with. So um, I know we've spent a lot of time on that question. Uh, do we, uh, if we have time for one more, I think? Uh, yes, sir, we have time for one more question. Uh, please offer your, your perspectives on the DOD defining a proscriptive MPE solution that complies with all policies versus letting services and units develop their own solutions that must comply and be potentially certified. That's a big one. That's a, that's, um, that's a good question, though. And it's uh, the way uh, from you know, our perspective in, in, and we're looking at it right now is the, the DOD... Technology-wise, I don't think they, that's a, uh, something they want to jump on. Policy and uh, tech, you know, zero trust. Here's the things, the rules you have to meet to be, uh, you know, to meet these requirements, to you know, have your solution and everything else. That's what they do. That's what the DoD does. They're policymakers. Um, the DoD CIO, you know, Randy Resnick's office, all those people are there to help kind of define that. And this, also the CDAO, which is a bigger player. We haven't even really, you know, I didn't even mention those. But the services, as we all know, have their individual missions and requirements. So th a prescriptive solution, even inside the services, we've all seen, the, the Army loves to be cookie cutter, but we also know that not every unit is the same, and you can't apply the same solution to every unit. It's not going to work. Now, it might work 80, 70, 80 percent of the time, but you got all those other one-offs or those other types of organizations or mission requirements that no, it's, you, you can't help, give them a JNN. You know, they're a five-man team that's going into whoever. That's not going to work. So it's it's you know that's and so it's just one of those uh, those, those things that from the DoD perspective, I think at policy and procedures and authorizations, and also with working with the NSA to you know to provide those guidelines, and then the services would get after how to address that. And we've been working at we talked with all the services as COCOM. We, you know, and try to keep them uh, understand that, hey, yeah, you have your own missions, you have your own things to do, but let's try not to get too far off from each other. So that way we are, because we still have to maintain our own compatibility and interoperability within each other. 
you know, and we don't need another Granada, you know, <laughs> and, and so that's you know, one of those, uh, those things that we have to also keep in shop, and that's what the COCOMs do. That's part of our job is to kind of uh, keep, an, you know, kind of talk, keep those conversations happening so you meet your requirements, but it's not so one-off that when you need to come play with the Army, the Marines, the Air Force, that now we have to develop another solution so the two of you can talk. So, anybody want? Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the idea is standards, use cases, and maybe some defined interfaces for interoperability is a good place to go. Uh, I'm going to speak here from direct, you know, hands-on over the past. Oh, I don't know, two weeks. Uh, two, if you look at some of the stuff that would be coming out of Pack Fleet and you look at some of the stuff that is coming out of user pack, all kind of rolling up under Indo-PACOM, they have different technologies to meet their operational needs. Now, what might be accounted for as an identity can be something that could be consistent, uh, but how each, of those, how each of those things are implementing controls are gonna be uniquely si situated based off of the type of capabilities that they're working on. Uh, and the unique circumstances in which those technologies are employed. So if I'm, you know, say dealing with uh, a first core stack versus a Centrix Maritime Kit stack, they're very different, but the I concepts like identity and things that need to ultimately roll up to an Indo-PACOM level can be consistent. And so I think that's worth considering you can't specify what the Navy is going to do over the Army or what the Army is going to do over the Navy, but you can say there's some standards in which they have to be able to share information, and that's what they should be you know, held to when they're building out their individual environments. So I, I agree. Uh, there's certain criteria that should be standardized, but we've already seen within our theater that the Navy has produced their own IMN. We have Indo-PACOM's INM. It, we don't even know if they're going to be interoperability, like the interoperability of the two systems. So it's, um, we, it's concepts. We we've already seen it with our joint networks. We need a unified network. I mean, we've gotten so diverse that we are not able to communicate with each other when we're required to. So if we don't start with the standardized requirements, maybe based on, you know, ICAM, Zero Trust, maybe standardizing very specific things, um, we're going to end up in the same situation we currently are now with our networks where they're not interoperable. Yeah, so I'll, I'll offer, I'm not a big fan of prescriptive anything. Um, I think it, it binds people and more importantly, it doesn't just bind solution, it binds thinking. People stop thinking of innovative new approaches. I think that's where kind of got us to where we're at. We got really comfortable doing things for 20 years in our current situations, and we had not really focused on what, what, where should we be going. So I'm not a big fan of prospect, uh, um, prescriptive approaches to anything, in, in all honesty. But when it comes to this specifically, I just believe that, again, the DOD or even at the, the Army level, there should be a very clear vision, strategy, and an end state that we're going towards that is adaptive. You know, at that level, it changes based on the new environmentals with constraints and restraints pushed down. Give people their, again, their guidelines to stay within, but give them the flexibility to make decisions based on their commander's intent. We have that thing in the military called commanders for a reason. They have their control of their operational environment. And the quickest way to get a commander to do their own thing is tell them you have to follow this thing that's, or you have to use this thing or follow this approach that does not mean their mission that they were also given by somebody, probably their boss, in a certain timeline. The, the biggest reason why we have this thing called shadow IT all over the place is yep. because we keep trying to create prescriptive approaches, we standardize things, and then we just cannot do it in a flexible, speedy manner to meet operational requirements by commanders. Commanders should drive that stuff. We should stay adaptive and non-prescriptive to meet that. Um, you know, my fa one of my favorite sayings, again, I say this a lot, but I, I really do, I love this saying, is, you know, standards are like toothbrushes. Everybody wants one, but nobody wants to use somebody else's. It's the yeah. same thing with prescriptive approaches. Yeah, I'll do a prescriptive approach as long as it was my prescriptive approach. I don't want yours. You don't know my mission. You don't have my commander that has this thing they have to do in this timeline. So I'm just not a big fan on the DOD at any level, whether it be the DOD or even the Army level, pushing a prescriptive approach to solve MPE. So let's say that you are you have an organization who's doing their own thing, but there is a slight uh, standardization. But then 
signing, signing the ATO. But that commander may be accepting risk at their level, but the signing of the ATO so they can interconnect with everybody else, they're putting it on that ATO responsibility. So what I would offer is as the zero trust concepts keep growing and keep becoming a fundamental approach to again data centric, ATOs will also have to adapt. ATOing a physical administered environment makes no more sense when I can control data and the security of that data. The ATO has to now be bound on the, the data flows, not just arbitrary administrative connection points. Well, that's why I think if you want anything, there's some standards around interoperability. Mm -hmm. Saying so you, you do whatever you, I don't tell you how to suck the egg. That, I just that's, tell you to suck the egg. That's, 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 that can be clearly defined in the vision and the, the end state and really easy to you know, articulate in restraints and constraints without being so prescriptive that you must use RESTful API. Like, and that's what I mean. Prescriptive gets real overwhelming. People get down to like, hey, you're gonna make me be prescriptive, then fine, give me the playbook so I can just go and follow your rules. Step one, step two, you get away from being prescriptive and saying, hey, again, in military planning, I have restraints and constraints, things I have to do and things I can't do. As long as you stay within that, which includes maintaining interoperability. I mean, we have a whole organization at the DOD level called uh, JITIC that was founded upon this. Like, this is not a new thing. Like, it, you know, JITIC's a little slow. If anybody's from JITIC, I apologize. You know, because again, JITIC was founded, I believe, based on Grenada and interoperability of like waveforms and that kind of stuff. While now we have things that are mainly fundamentally built upon things like the OSI model, which is like JITIC for the world. Like, so it's really not that hard. It just has to be something needs to be done no exactly yeah. constraints and restraints give people those those left and right limits hey work within this and this is our vision at the, the senior level in our end state we're trying to drive for and again they leaders know how to manipulate that over time hey i got new environmentals i got new feedback from the field i have different you know enemy situation etc cetera, etc cetera. that should stay as close to a standard but it's very again you know end state vision strategy and some constraints and restraints, and that's it, at that level. Once you get back down to an operational level, I think the Army has chosen the, the division as the you know, unit of maneuver, then the division determines based on their mission, especially at that time, because again, you send, say, the 18th Airborne Corps, 82nd specifically, into a desert, they're gonna have a totally different mission constraints than if you send them into like a jungle environment. You know, everything might work different. Their size, mm -hmm. the ping power pipe, all those yeah. kind of things have to stay adapted at their level. All right, guys. Um, great conversation. I know, and we, you know, we'd love to continue us on, but uh, we're, we're actually over our time. Um, so this, this has been great and everything, so. Thank you. And thank you, Chief. Thank you, panel members. Yes, I think it was a great conversation. I'm not sure we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we'll wrap it up now, but I don't think we'll wrap up the discussion anytime soon. I think we've been discussing MPE for at least five or six years. Forever. The yeah. keynote lunches in... Um, across the way at, in the top of ballroom. Uh, for those of you who want to go, also if you don't have, haven't downloaded the FCA uh, TechNet app, please do because there's all the agendas, panels, information, speakers. Thank you.